I'm going to introduce Kathy Curto. Kathy lives in Cold Spring with her husband, their four children, and one big dog. Everybody here, but the, the, everybody's here but the dog. Her writing has been published in Lumina, The Mom Egg, Splash of Red, The Beacon Dispatch, The Journal News, and The PCNR. Her work has also been featured on NPR, as well as in live performances at the Art Garden, Letters to Our Ancestors, and Mama Palooza. Palooza. Kathy is a graduate of St. Lawrence College and Hunter's School of Social Work, and in 2006 she was awarded the Kathleen Gerfein Writing Fellowship of Sarah Lawrence College. She has taught writing in Empire State College and is an adjunct professor of sociology at the St. Thomas Aquinas College. Welcome, Kathy. chapters from a collection that I've been working on for several years and um, hopefully someday we'll be bound. <laughs> um, and uh, what I'm trying to do is, um, well the collection basically is our memoir pieces that take place um, between um, the age of about 5 to 18. And uh, each chapter is um, told in the voice of the age that I'm at the time. So today I'm sharing uh, chapter two and about chapter seven, and uh, I'm about six in chapter two and about 11 in chapter seven. So here goes. <clears throat> Trading hair pieces for oil changes, 1972. I figure all daddies take their hair off at night, <laughs> but not but not everybody's daddy has a velvet hairpiece stand in the shape of a head that sits on the hair until morning. That's the kind my daddy has. Not those cheap styrofoam kinds like in the dusty, smelly back room at Leo's barber shop. No way. My daddy's hairpiece stand is like a big, fake head, but it's soft and fuzzy. Another good thing about the fake head is that it doesn't have those stupid-looking eyes painted on it. They're not cheap, Freddy, these stands, Leo, Leo says, but they're classier than the rest, and they're better for the piece. Leo is my father's barber, and he says there's nothing worse than when a customer takes his hairpiece off at night, puts it on the stand, and sees it slide right off the styrofoam holder. That's what happens with the styrofoam ones. Nothing for the piece to cling to, Freddy, Leo says, and swings his skinny arms in the air. Every night, my dad squints his eyes up real tight and yanks his stiff, shiny hair right off of his head. He lets out a big ah once it's off. My mother makes the same sound when she takes her stockings off at the end of the day before she puts her apron on to get dinner started. On nights when things are easy in our house and when I'm happy to see my daddy walk in the front door, his uniform all greasy and smelly like gasoline and broken cars, I follow him into the bathroom, sit on top of the toilet seat, and watch him rip the hair right off of his head. I squint up my eyes, too, and I even get a chill up my back and down my arms. I see three lines of pink blisters on his scalp and smell the sticky glue and tape he uses to stick his hair on every day. The whole thing makes my stomach do somersaults, but I can't help but watch. Those blisters remind me of the way Lisa Antonelli's baby brother's rear end looked when I saw her mom change his diaper. It was red and it was scary, and even though it looked a little like my daddy's head, I didn't say anything, because I guess all, all I thought all daddies had sore heads with sour pink blisters, and what would be the use in talking about it anyway? When the hair pieces get old and fuzzy and dried out, daddy calls Leo and orders a new one. 
I love when this happens because it means I get to keep the old ones for my dolls. I trim it and wash it, tie rubber bands on it, and practice my braids and my ponytails. The other thing that happens when a hairpiece gets old is Leo comes to the house and my daddy gets to sit on a stool in the middle of the kitchen under the ceiling light. My mother puts a clean dish towel on his shoulders. Leo trims the fluffy gray hairs around his ears and holds little patches of fake hair next to daddy's head to match the color. Leo, where does that hair come from anyway? I ask and dip the veal into the bowl with the slimy raw eggs, then into the breadcrumbs like my mom tells me to do. Me and my mom make chicken cutlets for dinner all the time, but she always makes veal for Leo when he comes to the house. It's only right, she says, and Daddy nods his head up and down and tells her not to forget to make the escarole salad with the crushed red pepper, because Leo likes that. Oil changes are free for Leo because of the hair pieces, and two weeks ago, Leo took his oldie rust, ru rusty old car to the shop for an oil change. He kept talking about what a good cook my mother was. I bet Daddy liked that. It probably made him feel like a big shot, and he probably loved it when Leo said in front of all the customers that day, Freddie, I'm telling you, that wife of yours, she can make meatballs out of cardboard. I'm on a stool in, the, in front of the stove next to my mother who turns the cutlets with one hand and keeps one hand in front of me. I figure that Leo doesn't hear me over the cracking oil sounds the veal makes, so I ask him again, Leo, where'd you get the hair? Leo is the only grown-up I don't call mister. I don't even know Leo's last name. It's always just Leo, and I guess that's okay with everybody because I don't get yelled at or anything. Finally, he answers, from people who have too much, little lady, he says, and winks at me. So they just give it to you? Do they cut it off themselves? Do they put it in a bag? Do they wash it first? Don't ask so many questions, doll, Daddy says, and go get Daddy his cigarettes. <laughs> And by the way, my father actually did have a cigarette machine very much like that in his gas station, which I think is pretty wild. 